is here, Mr. Jim Roche, who is one of my favorite professors, and he's having an opening um, on Saturday night of his work with his wife, Alexa Kleinbar, at Rosebud Gallery. Redbud. Redbud. I knew I could that wrong. But uh, go check it out. Jim was very instrumental in my love of art, and uh, I'm so glad they're all here today. As well as Bradley Summerall, who's the curator of collections at the Ogden Museum, is here. Um, so we have a nice little in New Orleans. Uh, Florida contingency here. Um, and Bradley also wrote in the New Southern Photography Catalog. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the exhibition, how and the genesis of the show, and uh, some of my ideas about the exhibition. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit about the 25 photographers who are in the exhibition. And uh, I guess at the end, maybe ask some questions. So um, I think I know how to do this. but. This here is the cover of the catalog that we did, which we're really proud of. Uh, that was published by University of New Orleans Press. And um, it's available on Amazon and at the Ogden Bookstore. And I have one copy here tonight that I'm going to give to Ashlyn for this um, talk. But I'm really proud of the, of the catalog. And this is the cover. It was designed by Jeff Louvier of Louvier and Vanessa. And we, uh, we really wanted kind of a pop image on the front. I actually kind of co-opted this uh, cover from an Andy Warhol book of photographs that they used to work at Robert Miller Gallery and there was a beautiful Andy Warhol um, book they put out called Andy Warhol Photographs and I just love the graphicness of the, of the font and uh, we didn't want to put an image on the cover because we didn't want to like uh, give power to just one image of one of those 25 artists in the exhibition. Okay, so I'm going to have to show you how to advance this. Okay, cool. Thank you. So here are the list. This is the back cover of the catalog. These are the list of the photographers in the exhibition. As Ashlyn said, I really wanted to focus on emerging, kind of mid-career, and underrepresented photographers. There's no Sally Mann in the exhibition. There's no Mark Steinmetz. There's no Mod Schuyler Clay. I love all those people. Uh, they're all my friends. We've all given solo shows at the Ogden. They didn't need a show. I really want to promote 
these folks who I think really um, are making fantastic work and are underrepresented. Here we go. And here's the Spot Magazine article that Ashlyn had mentioned, and it was written by Susie Khalil, and this is what really kicked in the idea of New Southern Photography. We've been doing an exhibition of the object for a few years called New Southern Photography, but what the show was was recent acquisitions to the Ogden Collection. And when Susie wrote this article uh, and really focused on what I was trying to do as a curator and promote all this new work, um, the director of the Ogden really loved the idea and was like, we need to run with this idea of New Southern Photography. I think we got something here. So that was kind of our, um, our little identity for this exhibition. And it started with this article that came out in the spring of 2013. And I will get this right one of these days. Okay. Uh, here's a, uh, an installation shot of the, of the exhibition. It was the largest photography exhibition the Ogden's ever uh, produced. It's, I would say, 6,000 square feet of well, uh, uh, gallery space. It's on three floors. Uh, the largest area is on the fourth floor. This is our fourth floor gallery, which we never show photographs in. So we had to do a lot of tweaking of the building, uh, blocking out light and stuff to make this uh, doable for the exhibition. What you're seeing there in that installation shot, I'll talk about their work a little bit more, and that's um, Sad Tropics from uh, Traviesa and Molina. Um, I wanted to give everybody a, be able to show a body of work. There are 25 photographers, depending on the scale of the work, photographers have between five and 20 pieces in the exhibition. So this gallery here, I call this the uh, land gallery because it all deals with land and space and there's three photographers in this gallery on your on y'all's right is celestia morgan um, on the left is alex Rebecca here with back east and the back wall is cal alfred um, bottom of the boot here's another gallery i call this gallery the abstract gallery or the surrealist gallery there's three photographers in there this is alex gravick uh, excuse me uh, maury Gertmeller, and uh he's out of atlanta we'll talk about his work later and we'll be able to in the background uh, this gallery here we have tommy call in the front and in the back tommy call a real imitation in the back is jared Sorez, small town hip hop so like i said i want to show a body of work of all these folks. And here's uh, another gallery with, this is um, this is just kind of what I call one of the large scale gallery and the um, uh, another kind of landscape, industrial landscape gallery. And this is Andrew Moore <coughs> photograph here. So I'll talk now about, there's 23 bodies of work in the show. There's 25 photographers, 23 bodies of work. Two of the bodies of work are by husband and wife teams, but there's 25 photographers total. So the first guy is David Emmett Adams, and uh, you guys might know, probably a lot of these folks you guys know, David is actually from Tucson, Arizona. I met him at Photo Lucida in Portland, um, and the series is called Power, and what he's photographing is the industrial landscape, in particular, the American oil industry. And he's photographing in the 19th century process, which is the tin type, and what he's photographing on are the lids of 55 gallon oil drums. So if he's photographing the, uh, the, an image and onto a product of the, a byproduct of a building in which he's photographing. So I think conceptually it's just really amazing. And when I met him, he's out of Tucson, Arizona, and all his photographs were done in the Southwest. And um, I was in, a, in a California, I was like, David, I gotta make you a son photographer because uh, I really want you in the show. And so he made this whole body of work. He traveled, he has a big truck that he travels in, the rolling dock room, and he drove all the way to Louisiana, made all this work and drove back. And most of these were made in Texas. So here he is with his camera. Um, this piece, this is called Flint Hills Resources, West Plant, Corpus Christi, Texas, wet plate collodium on 55 gallon barrel lid. So these are all made, direct posit in the field. He processes them on site. They're, so they're one of a kind, unique images. Um, what, I, what I also like about them is, you know, in photography, we're photographing the three-dimensional world on a 
two-dimensional surface, but with these lids and what he's doing, they're very sculptural. So I like the idea of the sculpture he's bringing to these pieces. And there's 12 of these in the exhibition. He has his own gallery. Kel Alfred, bottom of the boot, Louisiana's disappearing coast. Uh, Kel is out of uh, Dallas. And uh, she teaches at SMU, I believe, and she's a photojournalist. She was embedded with the U.S. Army when they invaded Iraq in 2003. And uh, this is her project she did right after the BP oil spill in uh, South Louisiana. That's a book by Fallline Press of the same name. Um, and so what Kel was photographing in these communities, a lot of them were Native American communities on the Louisiana coast that were impacted by the BP oil spill. And also, um, they're also about to be the first climate refugees in America because Louisiana is losing two football fields an hour of land. And uh, so these folks are, are just hanging on barely. And most of them work in the fishing industry. And so it's this whole, this is called Walter Darter with his father's house after Hurricane Gustav and Ike. Well, this one's actually from 2008. So she was down there a little bit before BP, the BP happened. But they're beautiful images, and what, I, what you're gonna see with a lot of this work is there, a lot of it's in the uh, documentary tradition, but it's a fine art aesthetic that really resonates throughout the work, which I, which I really gravitate towards. Elizabeth Bick, street ballet. Elizabeth is originally from Houston, uh, she lived in New Orleans before Katrina. She got flooded out. She lived in New York. She went to Yale, studied with Gregory Crutzen. She was actually Gregory's uh, assistant for a while there. And now she teaches at SBA, uh, School of Visual Arts in New York. And this series is called Street Ballet. And it's a kind of a postmodernist take on street photography. And uh, what she does is uh, they're made in several cities, Houston, New Orleans, New York. She photographs, sets up her camera and static, and makes these just single images of just one static area within you know public space, and gets these great, and then grids them together. So they kind of pay homage to the Edward Moybridge locomotion studies, I believe, with the animals in uh, the 19th, early 19th century, late uh, early 20th century, late 19th century. This one's in New Orleans. And these are quite large, like 60 by 40 inches. This is Houston. Krista Blackwood, y'all probably know Krista. She's out of Austin, and uh, she shows in New Orleans. And uh, the name of this series is called Naked Lady, a Red Dot. And what it's about is um, reconfiguring the Western landscape and the history of the Western landscape from a feminist uh, position. Uh, being a female, and what she's doing is the red dot symbolizing nude in the landscape, and it's it's reference to Edwin Weston, Ansel Adams, F64 Club. These are photogravures, uh, 19th century process, and uh, most of these are made in kind of the Big Bend area of, of Texas. There's quite a few Texas artists in this exhibition, and then there's the red dot right there. That's the dot girl there. That piece is about 48 by 48, and it's in the Ogden collection. John Chiara, Mississippi. Now, this is a book of his photography called Mississippi, put out by the Rose Gallery in Los Angeles. And what these are, they're ilfachrome, uh, direct positive photographs um, made in the field in Mississippi. And the cameras he has are huge. A couple of his cameras, he can actually get inside of them during the exposure, and he's inside the camera, uh, dodging and burning the print. So what this is, it's a piece of photographic paper he cuts out, places on the back of his handmade uh, large camera, and he has his assistant take the lens cap off. So he's inside the camera, you know, dodging and burning, and making these beautiful abstract, very painterly landscape photographs. And there he is with his camera. And he shows, and this is one of his smaller cameras, actually, um, and he, he carries around the back of the truck, just parks it, <coughs> spends all day looking at the light, and makes maybe one or two exposures. Um, we borrowed th these from the Do Good Fund and Jackson Fine Art in Atlanta. I'll these photographs. And he came to the opening, he's really, really nice guy. 
and that's another one there. And these all made in Mississippi. And they're very beautiful. They're very uh, painterly, like I said. And I'll probably know Scott Dalton, right? He's a Houston guy. Um, Scott Dalton, Where the River Bends. I saw this work at the, Mex the Mexican consulate in New Orleans has art shows every month, and I saw this work there, and it just blew me away. And this was probably five years ago, and I, I was like, Scott, i got to put you in a show. i got to figure out how to get you in a show. Um, and finally, the opportunity came to do some photography, and the series is Where the River Bends. And what that series is about is the relationship between El Paso, Texas, and Juarez, Mexico, and two cities that are culturally, economically bound, but separated by the Rio Grande River, an uh, international border, and you know the wall, and so on. So it's about, he photographs on both sides of the border, makes these beautiful, once again, in the documentary tradition, uh, photographs, but they have this very beautiful, fine art aesthetic, almost Vermeer light in a lot of them. And uh, he was supposed to be here tonight, but I already got called on assignment to go photograph the caravan. So, uh, so on one side of the border, you have El Paso, Texas, is one of the safest cities in America. On the other side, you have Juarez, Mexico, which is one of the most violent, over 8,000 murders in the last decade. So this is a photograph, this is what I'm talking about, how this Ramir Lighty gets it. This is a Lucha Libre, is that how you say it? Uh, El Paso, Texas living room. He has his own gallery in the New Southern Photography Exhibition, Funeral Procession, Juarez, Mexico. And this is a family at the bridge about to go across that work in El Paso. There are two films in the exhibition. I really wanted to include film and video because, you know, it's camera-based, it's lens-based, it's moving imagery. Uh, one of the films is Joshua Gibson, The Kudzu Vine. And uh, Bradley actually told me about this film, and I fell in love with it as soon as he, sh he showed me a, um, a little run of it. And uh, The Kudzu, uh, let me back up. Joshua teaches experimental film at Duke University in North Carolina. and. Uh, it's a hand-processed 35 millimeter black and white film. It's about 20 minutes long, and it's about the kudzu vine. The kudzu vine was a vine that originated from Japan that was introduced to the American South in the 1930s, and it was introduced as a way to control topsoil erosion. But what they didn't take into consideration is it grows a foot a day, and it's basically overtaken the South, and as William Christenberry says, it's the plant that devoured the South. And uh, so this is a beautiful film about kudzu and how it's introduced to America, then it introduces all these characters who are waxing poetically about the uses of kudzu and making food and paper and all this other good stuff. And uh, so it's just ironic that the vine, the plant that's become most recognizable with the South now, probably usurp the magnolia blossom, is an invasive species. It uh, figures into Kristen Berry's photographs and the REM album cover, Murmur, very iconic images of Kudzu. The other uh, video in the, in the exhibition is by uh, Brittany Labatt, and it's a little rock and roll video for the band Elf Power, which is a band out of Athens, Georgia. And um, Brittany is uh, Mark Steinmetz's assistant. I don't know if, if y'all know Mark's work, but Brittany's is an assistant lives in Athens, Georgia, and I just fell in love with this little video she did for the band Elf Power, and it's called Transparent Lines. It's about three minutes long, and it's it's this very uh, melodic rock and roll kind of song with this girl named Natalie who's clogging, which is a, um, a high, you know Appalachian folk dance to this rock and roll song. So the irony is just is, is that. So it's a cute little song, um, and she's a great photographer on her own. But I really love this video she did. This is Mari Gertmiller. He's out of Atlanta, Georgia. He studied at the University of Georgia. And um, he's from Texas originally. And he, uh, his series is called Do the Priest in Different Voices. Uh, I believe he teaches now at Kennesaw State uh, University. He just got married today, by the way. I saw the pictures on Instagram. And uh, he's about to have a book come out by uh, Abads and publish his book. And, 
his work is just so fabulous. And I don't know if y'all saw the Time Magazine article about the New American South, but they used this image in it, which we were really happy about. And uh, Mari's work is about, he talks about in a statement, being growing up in, in a religious family and reading the Bible and never being able to understand the words, kind of like my experience. But the pictures in the Bible he loved, and he could relate to the story via the pictures, the illuminated text. So all of his photographs are verses, the titles for all his photographs are verses from the Bible. So he basically stages these um, images, constructs these images based on verses in the Bible. And the name of this person, uh, this uh, photograph is, they will be punished with everlasting destruction. This one's called, you always resist the Holy Spirit just as your father did. And I consider Mari kind of a modern day surrealist. In my essay in the uh, New Southern Photography Catalog, I kind of compare his work to Clarence Sean Lachlan um, in that kind of magical realism, surrealism. This one's called A Flame Came Out Out of the Rock. Okay, this is Alex Gravett, Gravett, excuse me. Uh, he teaches at Longwood University in rural Virginia. And the name of his series is called Back East. And what his work is about is when he was going to school at Maryland Institute of Art, um, he would commute from rural Virginia into school uh, every day. And he would see out of the train window, you know, the landscape changing from rural to suburban to urban and so his series is about that kind of hinterland that exists between the urban and rural and suburban land you know the, where the demarcations are kind of ambivalent so it's just this kind of deadpan take on you know why is this fence just what is it doing here what is it what's the function and just the man-made environment and the human um, intervention to the environment And growing up in Florida, I can really relate to this a lot. Except, yeah, well, it'd be a bulldozer, probably one. Aaron Harden, the 13th spring. Um, Aaron teaches at uh, what's it, Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. He's from Tennessee, I believe. And he studied at Hartford College. Um, with, I believe, Alex So, and, uh, um, and this is called the 13th Spring. This won the, uh, um, the, gosh, what's it? What, what award did this win? The Magnum Award, Student Award. And I saw that, I saw it um, on the internet somewhere, Magnum Award, goes to, you know, Aaron Harden. And I fell in love with the work right away, and I looked him up, I'm like, wow, he's from the South, so uh, you know, I think I was on the phone with him the next day, and, and when I visited him, I put him in the show. But the name of the title comes from the 13th spring, which relates to the 13th uh, year cycle of the cicada, or better known in the South as, the, uh, as a locust. And the cicada is an insect that molts for 13 years, and it comes out of the ground, and it you know, it makes a lot of noise and mates and it dies. And, but the gist of the, of, the, of the body of work is his wife, who was not able, uh, doc, the doctor said was not able to conceive a child, had a baby, became pregnant on the 13th spring within the cycle of the cicada. So that's the gist of the um, title. And so the work is about his wife having this baby in the 13th spring. There's all these, once again, biblical metaphors that run through the, the work, the say, uh, the immaculate conception with his wife being able to have, a, not being able to have a baby and conceive Noah's Ark here. This is what I get from it. I don't know if it's right or not, but I think that's Noah's Ark there. And what really, what I saw and hit me with this um, work is when I saw this image. And this was the image that they had for the uh, Magnum Prize. And I was like, oh my God, that's just the previous thing I've ever seen. And uh, anyway, this is the snake, Garden of Eden. 
at least that's what I get from it. He also was studying to be a preacher, so I'm probably, probably right. Uh, Courtney Johnson, Light Lure. Um, I must say, a lot of these photographs I'm showing, um, I discovered their work through Candela Gallery and Books out of Richmond, Virginia. The Gordon Statinius, who runs the gallery, really doing avant work there, showing very amazing photography, including Morgan's work here, uh, I believe, debuted there. And uh, Courtney is one of um, uh, the artists at Candela. And um, she teaches at University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And what this series is called Light Lure, and Light Lure is a series of underwater pinhole photographs that she made off the 19 piers on the Atlantic coast off North Carolina. So these are all made with a handmade camera. That's her camera there, which is a cookie tin that she sinks off the piers with these weights with the fishing line and makes these exposures. So what you're getting these really weird painterly abstract photographs, which I just love because it brings back photography to its relationship with painting. So here you have complete abstraction. There's nothing photographic about this except the process. So they become these very beautiful abstract ambivalent images. Underwater pinhole photographs. So this is in that gallery where I called it the abstraction kind of surrealist gallery. And these are quite large. They're about, actually they're about that size, about 40 by 48, something like that. Tommy Ka, a real imitation. Tommy Ka uh, is uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, and he's of Chinese descent, and he's a gay man of Chinese descent in Memphis, Tennessee, and that's what his work was about, pretty much. And it's also about self-portraiture, and so he's in a lot of his photographs, um, and that's Tommy there. And he has a book out from, uh, uh, Ain't Bad put out a book of his photographs, too, and um, this is, he studied at Yale with Elizabeth Dick, he was in the class, and he lives in New York, in Brooklyn, but he photographs a lot in Memphis. So this is from a series, A Real Imitation. And this one was actually made in Iceland, but I put it in the show. And that's, of course, the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis where Martin Luther King was assassinated. Um, Tommy also has another series where he plays a, uh, where he is a Chinese Elvis impersonator, which uh, I really want to show that work at some point. This is Lugia and Vanessa, who are out of New Orleans. They're a husband and wife team, and uh, the name of the series is Res and Nita, or Echoes. And uh, what these photographs are, they kind of harken back to what we're talking about with um, with Courtney Johnson, kind of photographing the the un, which you can't see with the naked eye. But these are photographs of sound. And Jeff is a, a musician, and his wife Vanessa is a painter and photographer. So these are mixed media. Um, so what they did is they built this spectrograph kind of machine, and these are different notes that they photographed. So this is a D note. And then this is an A. And these are quite large, they're about 48 by 48. I believe, Ashlyn, you showed this work here? Or? They were shown, I think, about three years ago. Okay. Yeah. And then that's the grid of the, I believe, all the notes on the um, the 12 bass notes of musical scale. Carl Martin, out of Athens, Georgia. I love Carl. He's um, he went to uh, SBA in New York. He's an architect in Athens and photographer. He's Guggenheim winner. Very underrecognized. His he just had a book published by Fall Line Press, which is not this work. It's a different body of work. This is his newest work, and this is called Public Gesture. And kind of what Elizabeth Big was doing with people moving in the public sphere with this work, he wanted people to act out how the architecture made them feel. So he has people interacting, or he might say to this fellow, "Can you do a little interpretive dance of how this?" building makes you feel, so they'll do these weird little poses. And it's very fun and deadpan and, uh, 
And this is one of my favorite pictures because he's taking a picture of these guys and they're like looking at him going, that guy's taking my picture. Christina Molina and Jonathan Traviesa, Sad Tropics. This is another New Orleans husband and wife photography team. Uh, both of them are from Florida. And uh, Jonathan tra uh, tra trained, uh, studied at Tulane, and he teaches at Tulane University. Christina Molina was uh, from University of Florida, and she teaches at Southeastern Louisiana um, University. And they both are members of uh, the Front, which is a gallery, artist-run gallery in New Orleans. And Sad Tropics is about the mythology of Florida and um, the history of Florida. And so they use clues from, visual clues from advertising, popular culture, and tabloid uh, journalism to do this kind of deadpan, ironic uh, body of work about the state of Florida. And what this here is a large, it's called photo, it's called photo text, and it's a large decal, basically it's a photograph. It's a decal that you can apply on the wall. So that's a photograph of these palms and then they put these photographs on top of it and make this installation. There's also individual images like this one uh, of the great state of Florida. And then, you know, about a paradise lost. Florida, you know, in the history has been about an earthly paradise. And this is kind of about how that earthly paradise has, you know, kind of been lost by development and so on. Thank you. Andrew Moore, um, I just called entitled this Southern Photographs because he's actually two bodies of work from him in the exhibition. And these are quite large, these are like 40 by 60 inches. And Andrew Moore um, teaches at uh, SBA in New York and these are made with an eight by 10 camera. And uh, what he likes to photograph are places or regions that are in areas of transition. Uh, whether economically, socially, politically. He's photographed in Cuba, he photographed in Russia after the wall came down, and so on. And this is photograph is called the Zydeco Zinger, and this is the abandoned Six Flags outside of New Orleans that went out into water after Katrina, and it's still abandoned like that. And you can, a lot of people break in there and photograph. And uh, this is his photograph. And this is, I, I borrowed this from, uh, Jackson Fine Art loaned these to us. And then this is the um, abandoned Six Flags too. This photograph's called Too Cheap for Roses. Um, Andrew Moore also did that documentary film on Ray Johnson, the artist called How to Draw a Bunny. I don't know if y'all ever seen that. It's a really beautiful painterly pictures. And this is from his most late, latest series, and it's, it's about the um, Black Belt area of Alabama. And this photograph's called Blue Sweet. And it is uh, 72 inches by 42 inches. Once again, the Black Belt of Alabama is a region that's economically depressed. If you go there, there's ghost towns, basically, where people have fled because the economy has collapsed. <clears throat> Celestia Morgan, Red Line. <coughs> Celestia Morgan is from Birmingham, Alabama. She studied at the University of Alabama, and she teaches at University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, which I must say, there's a lot of really great photographers coming out of the University of Alabama, Birmingham, right now. Um, and her series is called Red Line, and what Red Line is about is uh, it's a meditation on the history of systematic and racially biased housing discrimination in Birmingham, Alabama. And what you're seeing here are these maps that were created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation at points uh, that designated neighborhoods based on uh, their viability and in, in, in who they would lend to. And they came out in the 1930s and they were totally based on race. And the categorization that they would loan were based on things like best, very desirable, definitely declining hazardous, and Negro concentration. So these are all Negro concentration neighborhoods based on these maps. And so what she did with these GPS coordinates is she created these um, she took directly from the maps and she projected them onto photographs of the sky with the metaphor being in the sky, there are no boundaries. And so these are called sky maps. 
with the outlines of these neighborhoods. And this is the result of redlining for photographs of these different neighborhoods in Birmingham. And if you go there today, they're just sitting, it's, it's so obvious to see what's happening. And also a byproduct of it was the internet, uh, interstate highway system kind of did the same thing where it went through racial lines. Here's another neighborhood. So in the exhibition, we have a series of the sky maps up, and we have a big grid of the houses from these neighborhoods that are projected. And the, um, the effects of red lighting. And this is called Disappearing Birmingham. Another Texan, y'all probably know Nancy Newberry. I don't know, she's out of Dallas. Uh, lives in Marfa, happy year. Um, she's done three bodies of work based on Texas that I know and we've shown at the Ogden through our current sex exhibition. One's called Moms, about the moms that they give girls here in Texas. It's a big deal. And the other one's called Halfway to Midland, which I really love. And this one's called Smoke Bombs and Border Crossings, which is basically about the history of Texas and the founding of Texas and the different factions who founded the state of Texas. So you have the cowboy, American cowboy, you have the Mexican cowboy and these competing teams that helped in the formation of Texas. She also pays homage to spaghetti westerns in the series and also a lot of these uniforms these uh, kids are wearing in, in her photographs, she actually sh sews herself. So some of these uniforms are kind of stand-ins for, they could be Confederates, they could be, you know, U.S. Cavalry or whatever, but Last one's called Sentinels. And then that's the installation at the Ogden, kind of out of focus, but you can see it's like probably 12 photographs, big wall. Ramel Ross, South County, Alabama, a hell county. Uh, Ramel was a basketball player for Georgetown University and uh, he played basketball and then he took art classes and he went on to study at RISD and now he teaches at Brown University um, in Rhode Island and um, Hell County, a, uh, South County of Hell County is deals with Hell County, Alabama, which is probably the most iconic place in Southern art history with Walker Evans photographing there in the 1930s and Let Us Now Pray Famous Men. And then of course, William Chris and Mary, who photographed there over 40 years. Um, Ramel moved down to Hell County. Uh, well, he bought a trailer in Hell County. And he started teaching basketball there and photography. And he's made this beautiful body of work about um, being a northerner and a black man coming to this iconic place and making art. And uh, he has a film that was just released that coincides with this work called Hell County This Morning, This Evening, that uh, debuted at the Museum of Modern Art and is now touring the country. And uh, he was just, uh, had a solo show at Aperture Gallery in New York, and he's, he's really blown up, and I love his work, and he's the nicest guy. This one's called I Home. This one's called The Giving Tree. And we have about uh, six of his pieces. They're quite large, they're 48 by, 36. And I've offered Ramel a solo show in 2020 at the Ogden. And we we're going to acquire a couple of these pieces for the Ogden collection. I'm proud to announce. The work is just beautiful, poetic. It's, you know, it has a subtext of politics, but it doesn't really come through in your face, it's just beautiful, it sucks you in. Witten Sabatini, Another Day in Paradise. Witten is a young, really young guy, he's probably all of 27. Uh, Bernie Imes introduced me to him. Uh, he's from the Mississippi Delta. He studied at Columbia College in, uh, Columbia College in uh, Chicago and well, while he was in school there, he wasn't interested in Chicago's subject matter, so he'd come down to Mississippi Delta a couple times a year and make photographs, and this Another Day of Paradox is what he actually did. And this is the only black and white series besides, I guess you could say, um, David Evan Adams and the exhibition. I don't know why that is. I just got to the very end. I'm like, that's not a black, black and white photographer in the show. 
And so we, uh, we chose the written internet, but we really love this work. And it's, I kind of think of him as a kind of up and coming Mark Stein. That's uh, very deadpan, uh, uh, combination of portraiture, landscape, still life, all made in the Mississippi Delta. Honk if you're horny. Jared Soren, Small Town Hip Hop. Jared is out of uh, Washington, D.C. He photographs for Newsweek magazine, Vanity Fair, uh, so on, so on. And this is what his art project. For a while, he was photographing for a newspaper in Roanoke, Virginia. And while he was down there, he got interested in the small town, the hip hop scene, and the small Appalachian community. So this series, which I believe is about 50, 15 or so in the exhibition is just about the hip hop music in Appalachia and these striving up and coming hip hop artists working their day jobs and at night they, they, they strive to make it big and it's kind of this, kind of sad <laughs> and funny and, and great at the same time. So here's uh, this fellow working his day job at 7 Eleven at night. He's a Susan Horsham, by the grace of God. Um, she's one of my favorite artists. She shows at Candela Gallery in uh, Richmond. Again, I put it in a show. Um, about five years ago, called Seeing Beyond the Ordinary. I love her work. Um, she works as a waitress at the best restaurant in Southern Living, called it the best restaurant in the South. It's called Opossum. We ate there when we went and, and, and picked up her work. And, uh, and then she makes these amazing photographs. And uh, the name, title of the series is By the Grace of God, and that's from the bumper sticker. Um, that said, American by birth, Southern by the grace of God. Uh, and her work is just a meditation on her life. It's very autobiographical, very, very metaphorical. Um, uh, all deals with Richmond, Virginia, where she grew up, where she lived. She had a very Southern Gothic, tragic upbringing. Her parents died when she was really young. Her brother committed suicide. So a lot of the folks you'll see in these pictures are stand-ins for her as a younger person. Um, beautiful landscape, and Latin root of this tree here is Virginia. So there's all these kind of coded messages in her photographs. Um, girl with cat, she actually made this photograph while she was waiting tables. Uh, she was, um, saw this girl leaning against this car in the parking lot of her restaurant, and she told her tables, look, I gotta make a picture, and I'll be back in a minute, she has a four by five camera. So she goes out there, sets this up, makes this picture, and runs back in and finishes the waiting table so it's a beautiful image. And I think it's a, uh, it relates to her and her punk rock days. And I love the cat, too. Beautiful still life that she creates. You know, she'll see a little scene, and then she'll add to it, like, I'll put these apples in the foreground. Beautifully lush work in the spirit of Eggleston, uh, Bernie Imes. Uh, Mod Schuyler Clay, and of course the Marine, which has become very iconic. Um, Marine Hotel near Airport, Richmond, Virginia, 2009. So. And that's all I got. Um, this is to tell everybody how that stands in for her narrative, this image. Well, this is what I talked about her brother being, uh, her brother was in the Army and committed suicide, so her. This, <laughs> Bella is kind of a, a stand-in for her brother. Um, so yeah, if you, you have to kind of get these stories, come out, her to tell you these stories, but yeah, there's kind of a, a big meaning behind a lot of these images. And um, this is one of her signature images, one of my favorite so hers. So. And this is at the Ogden Collection. So anybody have any questions? How did you define Southwest? Because I don't think of like the Southwest as being so. Yeah, well, you know, we for one in the book we used the um, we used the 2010 Census Bureau definition of the South because we have that problem all the time. Like, what is the South? Is Detroit the South? Is Chicago the South? Because right. of the Great Migration. 
I wanted to kind of push the buttons of like what is the South, because I know a lot of people like El Paso is in the South, you know? People say Texas isn't the South. People say where I'm from, Florida is not the South. Where I come from in Florida, it's very much the South. We call it LA, Lower Alabama. <laughs> but, uh, um, and Jim's from Vernon, Florida, by the way, if y'all have ever seen that film, and that's very much the South. So, uh, so that, I just want to play with that distinction of what is the South, you know? And, um, so basically, and it's up to us, you know, we have this discussion all the time, we talk about it, Bradley and I, and, you know, um, and what the parameters are, and I think it's just up for us to kind of make them up, you know. Uh, we define them, and, you know, unfortunately, one of the demarcations of what the South is, is the, what the Confederacy, and that's usually what people think of the, the states of the Confederacy. But you know, we it in. Some people say Rhode Island is the South. Delaware. Like yeah, yeah, and Texas, and you know, uh, like I said, Detroit, Chicago. I mean, I don't know, you know. Um, Western Pennsylvania. Exactly. So, uh, people say Cuba's the South. I've had people email me, you know, 600 word uh, explanations of why Cuba is the South. We've shown work from. Uh, Haiti, because there's a huge connection between, historical connection between New Orleans and Haiti. So that we can definitely make that connection. But then it gets kind of, you know, and everybody's like, well, what about the Bahamas? You know, Bahamas in Florida. You know, you can, where do you draw it? You know, so that's the thing. So I kind of pushed it where, you know, I think culturally, you know, definitely this part of Texas is more Southern than El Paso. A conceptual follow-up to the sort of geographic question. Um, you have artists like Susan, Ver Susan Wersham who are kind of continuing some of these tropes of the South. Uh -huh. um, and then you have people like Ray Mel Ross who are really intervening and trying to rewrite some of the history um, and insert people of color into the history. And so in a conceptual sense, how would you define this new South? Because it's become something that in an academic world is talked about a lot, um, this defining of the New South and what these global or regional parameters actually mean in a sort of idea sense. Right. Um, well, you know, we show work, it's usually of and about is what we say. So we show Walker Evans, you know, he's from, born in St. Louis, he most identified with New York, but he photographed some of the most iconic images in the South, so we have Ten Mark Rabbit's photographs in our collection. We have, you know, um, other artists that aren't from the South. Um, you know, Mark Steinmetz isn't from the South. He's from the North. And so, I mean, I just if the work is made or the mm -hmm. people are Southern, it's usually our definition. So we can show a person that was born in Memphis photographs of Tokyo if we wanted to. Well, I guess to sort of rephrase my question, what did putting this show together teach you about the South? Or what did you sort of realize about it as you put it together? Well, uh, we talk about in the, in the book about just the voices and how the voices giving voice to people that might not have had a voice before because it was kind of monolithic in the way it was being interpreted. So to give a, a gay man of Chinese descent a voice in this exhibition, and Ramel Ross, and Celestia Morgan, and Jared Soros was very important to us, and Bradley writes eloquently about this in his essay, uh, Long Live the South, The South is Dead, Long Live the South. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the main point of this show, is to show that the stories hated, and sometimes the, the more things change, the more they stay the same, but the st there's more voices now, and what, that's what we're trying to, uh, and speaking about the same place from different angles. So that was very, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it does, yeah. Yes. Well, I'm curious because if you're saying a number of the images you selected were because it gave voice to people from the unknown voice, and then I couldn't give Evan and his industrial images. So how does that relate to it? Um, well, I just, I think it related to when I'm trying to tell this overall story. I didn't want to show all of, um, first of all, I want to show a very diverse range of photographic techniques and diverse range of 
a photographer. So I don't have 10 photographers photographing the Mississippi Delta. You know, so I have my alternative processes guy here, David Emmett Adams, who I think is the best in the biz for one. And I think that's a very pertinent subject, the oil industry um, here in Texas and Louisiana and the way that's affected the environment, the industrial environment. Um, I can also see it in historical context with the Ogden Collection, which I talk about a lot about in my essay, where folks like Elmo Morgan Sr. were photographing the oil industry in Louisiana in the 1930s, and uh, Fonville Winans was photographing the fishing communities of Louisiana in the 1930s, just as Cal Alfred is here in the first decade of the 21st century. Um, so I just wanted the continuization of those stories. Um, so I thought he fit in context really well with the history of Southern photography and in our collection. So, um, and I just, you know, like I said, he wasn't, he's, you know, he's an outsider. He's from Tucson, and, but, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, his, his vision isn't valid. And like, I think some of the best images of the South are made by non Southerners. So, you know, Walker Evans keep coming back to him, but, you know, I love his work and what he did, so. Richard, I have a technical question, but I need to know. How does the guy get the, how does the, when those fish fly down, how does he keep that emulsion on the back? Uh, he just, he, he coats them in the, um, it's a collodion, which is a, it's a, it's a um, emulsion that has kind of a, a cotton sticky, yeah, yeah. So he coats them on, I believe in the field, and it's still wet when he does, they call it wet plate collodion. And then he processes it, you know, he sticks it right in the camera. And as it, after he makes the exposure, he can develop it. There's a video on YouTube, you can see his process. And um, he can do it kind of in the light. You can process it in the light. So he makes those on location. And he can only make about, I think he said, in a good day, maybe two. And, I'm just curious when Monson first came out here in Texas, it was a big photograph probably. We were we working, you know, maybe we were working on canvas, uh -huh. maybe 15 by 15 feet, we use mops to develop. But you couldn't put it on metal, maybe we couldn't get this. Right, yeah, it's the collodion. I don't know if he treats it somehow. He has to do something. <laughs> but he, he buys the oil with, you know, he buys those, or people give them to him. And then he, I don't know if he sands them or smooths them out or something, gives a little tooth, and then he puts the emulsion onto it. Could you tell us a little bit about the Ogden collection, though, and photography there and the uh, Yes, well, the Ogden collection, first of all, the Ogden Museum is, uh, its namesake is Roger Ogden, who's a New Orleans um, businessman who, at the age of 17, bought his first work of art, and then he got the bug, and he just started collecting art, and he's realized at some point he has thousands of works of art all dealing with the American South and there's no museum in America dedicated to art of the American South. So he's like, let's start a museum. And his first love is landscape paintings. So if you go to his house, it's floor to ceiling, 19th, 20th century landscape paintings. And photography, we've got about 1,400 works in the collection, which is a very large. Um, and you know, they go back from 1864 is our oldest photograph, and it's Alexander Gardner, uh, uh, ruins of a mill in Richmond, Virginia, you know, out of a uh, Civil War photograph up to the present. Uh, we have a really nice selection of kind of FSA era work. Um, we have a lot of Clarence John Lachlan, New Orleans kind of work. I have been focusing on my uh, collecting um, more on emerging recent people. Um, recent photographs from the last 10 years, so that's how I've kind of grown the collection from a lot of my peers, you know, because I'm a photographer myself. So I've met a lot of these folks like Susan and David and all these folks through uh, portfolio reviews, mainly internet, uh, gallery openings, but uh, we have 1,400 photographs in the collection. A uh, really nice selection of Bernie Imes and that really iconic Eggleston's uh, William Kristen Berry. We're doing a major show of William Kristen Berry's work next year. Bradley and I are curating, or I'm curating the photographs from the studio. We've already been to the studio. 
and uh, then Bradley's going to curate the paintings and sculpture, and um, hopefully we'll recreate drawings. Drawings. drawings are amazing, like thousands and thousands of drawings. And um, he's one. I grew up in Alabama, so I love Chris and Barry, and I saw a lot of those buildings when I was growing up. So it really means a lot to me to find. I wish we could have done it so he was still alive, but. Um, Really excited about that. And we have some major Chris and Mary pieces, but um, but the strength of the Ogden collection is paintings, sculpture. We do have a fine photographic collection, but um, it's like the uh, New Orleans Museum of Art. They were collecting photographs back to 1926, I believe, and they have like 10,000 photographs in their collection. We have 1,400. It's growing, but it's not, you know. So it's hard for me to do exhibitions from the collection without repeating myself, you know? So I, I try to do a show from the collection every year. I just did one on color photography um, a few years ago from the collection. And um, so. I have a question for you, uh, specifically about uh, like New Orleans photographers. Um, I would like to know if there are any names in particular that you're excited about. Um, like looking at some of the work that they're doing. Um, because thinking about the work that's coming out of New Orleans, you know, I see a lot of work about Katrina, a lot of work about poverty. Um, but it seems like they kind of get stuck there with one of those mm -hmm. because there's social issues. Yeah. Uh, and so I would like to know if there's any other work coming out of New Orleans that's of interest um, that moves, I guess, past those subjects. Well, Lydia and Vanessa is one. Christina Molina and Jonathan Travieso is the other that I've showed in this show. And one, that was one of the reasons, because they, they weren't like stereotypical, yeah. what you're talking about. But do you know Keith and Chandra, Keith McCormick and Sean, uh, Keith Calvin and Sean, Chandra McCormick? Are you familiar with their work? No. African American husband and wife team, once again, who've been documenting um, prison system in Louisiana. Uh, amazing work. They're about to have a show at Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans about workers in Louisiana. Um, they also represented New Orleans. They represented American Venice uh, a couple of years ago, and that was a result of the curator seeing the work at the Art Museum, the Angola work. Um, and you know, Deborah Lesser. Yeah, Deborah Lesser. I don't know if you know her work. She's probably the most famous artist in New Orleans. Uh, her one big self work of the prisons in Louisiana and. Uh, I forgot her last body of work about the murder sites, which I showed um, at, at the Austin. Yeah, El Cosmo Harris is a really young, developing African American photographer who wrote an essay for this book and just did an article in um, Bitter Southerner called The Desegregation of Southern Photography. And he really gave this exhibition a lot of props, but he's doing really well. I just had a show. New Orleans Museum of Art. That's a great photo community there, and I think New Orleans has a great photography history. You think of, actually, New Orleans was the second city in America where the new in, invention of photography was introduced after New York. It was, uh, photography was introduced to, in New Orleans in 1840 by Jules Lyon, who was a free person of color who went to Paris and studied the daguerreotype process from Louis Daguerre, brought it back to New Orleans, and was the big photographer in New Orleans in 1840. Um, unfortunately, none of his work survives, but there are lithographs of his and his records of him being a photographer in his studio in New Orleans. And then, of course, you have Belloc series, and then you have what Walker Evans did in New Orleans in the 30s, 40s, and you have Clarence Sean Lachlan, uh, you have Michael P. Smith, you have the photographs that Rick Friedlander made there. The uh, New Orleans Museum of Art just did a wonderful Friedlander show of all New Orleans photographs. Um, uh, God, who else do we talk about? Uh, Kevin Klein's a great photographer, photographs in the Mary. Josephine Sakabo is a magical realist, shows an egg gallery for fine photography out of New Orleans, which is one of the first photography galleries in America, opened in 1973. So, and I just did a show that I borrowed work from them at Doris Ullman exhibition. Um, her, her name is uh, Josephine Sapo, and she is she she's she's real. I, I find it really fascinating because she can take a she can take a uh, an iPhone photo 
and then take that photo through Photoshop back to an antiquated process like a photograph. Photograph, yeah. And she's from Laredo, Texas, originally. But she's been in New Orleans since the 60s and one is one of, really one of the last surviving members of um, old New Orleans Bohemia. Really fascinating mm -hmm. uh, photographer. George DeRoe, who passed away a few years ago, I don't know if you guys know about his work, but he was just finally recognized by Aperture Magazine uh, uh, with a book, by Aperture, with a book of his, a monograph of his photographs. But his story is he was known mainly as a painter in New Orleans, but he would paint from his photographs. And in the 1970s, Robert Maplethorpe came down to New Orleans and stayed with George and basically co-opted his style, took it back to New York, became a superstar. And George sat in New Orleans and made photographs and painted and was never, you know, mad about it or anything. And finally, when people would see a George Durow photograph, they're like, oh, that's a Maple Thor. But it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. And finally, Aperture made the, comp made the you know, intellectual um, connection between George and my Robert Maple Thor. So finally, in his death, unfortunately, George is getting recognized for his photography. So he's a very important figure in New Orleans photography. Um, so yeah, it's just, it, you know, it's a very photogenic town. I mean, I know it's it really down, is. But it, it's, it really attracts, and this photo, New Orleans Photo Alliance is huge. We do a photo NOLA, which is in December. There's over 40 photo exhibitions in the city. I will have one, and uh, there'll be 40 other ones. The New Southern Photography will be up. We do portfolio reviews. But it attracts people from all over America, and people kind of cycle through there. It's just like the opening for New Southern Photography out so soon. And because uh, people love New Orleans. Everybody loves New Orleans. People come down and photograph. You know, Alex Sutton made photographs there, everybody photographs there. Robert Frank, you know, his most famous photographs to me, streetcar. So thank you for your Yeah, but it's great community and um, the, you know, I, I talk about that in the um, the Bitter Southerner did a little story and we talked about New Sun Photography and I talked about how when I graduated from school in 98 from Florida State, Mr. Jim Roche here, and uh, my professors told me to go to New York. You know, that's where you go and make it as an artist, but I don't think that matters really anymore. It doesn't matter where you are, and I think there's more opportunity per capita for an artist in a town like Houston, New Orleans, Atlanta, Miami, you know, uh, than there is to go to New York. You know, in New Orleans, they have we have three really wonderful museums, and we have uh, the John Mitchell Center is there, um, which is pretty amazing. And uh, so there's a lot of opportunity to show, make a living. Well, that's another story, but yeah. um, but that's that's the same in New York too, unless you're independently wealthy. You know. Thanks. Were there certain things or topics that cropped up during the installation? After you got things yeah, you know, I mean, I should have said that I didn't work. I just kind of picked work I liked, and that was kind of sounds trivial. But and, but once I got in the gallery, I started making these connections that I'd never really did even when choosing the work. But like I said, I tried to make a broad range of tried to show a broad range of work, and you know, of course, the documentary tradition is predominant in, within the theme of the work, and. You know, you give me half a chance, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose a portrait of, of a person. So I try to stay away like it. I gotta put a landscape in here or something. But no, I just got, kind of made a lot of those connections after I kind of got the word. And it's really weird. So that's how I, we kind of, uh, it's got a nice sequencing. I've, some people, a lot of people compliment me on the sequencing of the exhibition. But I try to put people in certain rooms that the work speaks to each other as we speak, as we talk about like, I'd like to say something. Richard's saying, oh, I just picked work I like, and I didn't really think about it. That's not true, because I've sat next to this man for 10 years, and he thinks about it every day. <laughs> and what Richard has included in this exhibition, I believe, are the same things that run through the Ogden Collection, that run through Southern art, uh, especially photography, these ideas of the land, of identity, of family. Um, and all of that stuff is something Richard thinks about every day. So sure, he picked things that he liked, but this comes from a well-informed um, uh, position, I believe, so. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.